Hi, I am Julie Meyerwitz of HearMyWordsAutism.com. I am an autism coach for parents of children on the spectrum and for aut autistic adults. And I'm here with Cindy Alves. And Cindy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself in greater detail? Okay. Uh, my name is Cindy, uh, Cindy Alves. I <laughs> am a full-time um, caregiver. I'm a mother to two. My daughter, Alyssa, is 24 and my son, Justin, is 17. Um, happily married. And uh, he's the reason why I'm able to stay at home with uh, both my kids when they were younger. Um, very hard worker and takes care of his family. So uh, it's been a blessing for all of us. Um, let's see, Justin is dual diagnosed. He's um, autistic or has autism and uh, ADHD. Um, and as well as, you know, obviously uh, anxiety disorder and, you know, everything's all mixed up in you know, so um, it's all mixed up in there. But uh, yeah. my daughter also works. Um, she went to school for recreational therapy and she works. Cool. Yes, she works with adults with disabilities. She's a manager in a day program. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I've been advocating for 16 years right. um, before um, all the social media came about. It was, you know, in person. So mm -hmm. with um, the regional programs. Uh, Justin was diagnosed at 18 months. So from the get go, I started as soon as he, uh, you know, was diagnosed, we put him in a, at that time in 2006, we put him into um, daycare. And that was what they told you to do for the social uh, interaction. So we put him into daycare. And uh, that's where my advocating started, uh, right. right through daycare into um, uh, therapy and then into school and uh, elementary and then high school so everywhere along the road I followed him when he was in therapy programs I was at the hospital like uh, the regional program um, as a parent representative um, and I also did a lot of work with the schools um, one of my major things with the school before we left we had a snoozling room um, put in and what was uh, it called it, a snoozling room which is a sensory multi-sensory room snoozling yeah S N O E uh, Z E L E N. Oh, cool. So snooze, yeah, Snoozelin room is a multi-sensory room, and Snoozelin is the the brand name. So you can't just call uh, any room a Snoozelin room. Um, so it was, that was a fifty thousand dollar room, and uh, wow. we raised half the money in a year. Um, by doing, um, we did uh, a major fundraiser. So I was, you know, I was hoping to get it done. It was around grade seven and eight, but I was hoping to get it done before we left. But yeah. we got half the money done and most of the room, like the room was done. So wow. um, that's a big, big accomplishment, um, you know, mm -hmm. for elementary school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm and sure they use that difference for a lot of kids. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was for children, you know, with the disabilities, but also now um, I know they were used, starting to use it for typical kids with anxiety. So, you know, five, 10 minutes before tests, they would allow the students to go in there. And I would imagine that some of the teachers and therapists. Oh, yes. Also yes. Use it too for exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The, you know, the EAs would use yeah. it, the teachers would use it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, just to get uh, five, 10 minutes of calm. Yeah. Uh, it's important, very important. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what I've been doing. And, and, and I've, um, expanded my advocating now to social media platforms and uh two years ago we created looking at life through different lenses right and that's our pace uh, our facebook page and then we kind of expanded over like social media to instagram uh, looking at life with justin and we're on use tiktok once in a while facebook is where we majorly on like that's where our bigger numbers are um, but I'm looking at expanding now even more so into a, doing a podcast so that's kind of where I'm at and you have a new subgroup that you just started with like very recently. Oh yes, that that yeah. one is just a, it's more of a, like a smaller private group. Um, it's looking at life through different lenses, peer to peer support. Right. Um, yeah, so, you know, I found a lot of people, especially a lot of autistic uh, individuals were coming in and some of my live chats and, and they were getting really comfortable. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to create a private group um, where people of whatever, whatever neurodive, you know, where neurotype you are, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, where people can go in and kind of have that comfort. So it was, a, it's a private page. I'm not looking at growing it because I want to keep that, um, 
just yeah small right small and intimate so that people can you know not feel like if they want to share something they don't feel like everybody's reading it right right yeah and and on top of that i will be starting um with a local organization nonprofit, um a peer-to-peer -peer support with them two days a week wow. so i'll be doing that and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah. And in your free time, which you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody thinks I have free time because I, when I, as soon as I say I'm a full-time caregiver, right. it's automatically, you know, you get the mix of people saying, well, you know, we're less, I, I have to work. You know, it, it's, it's a battle between some people, right? And that's when I talk about. This empathy. is an old evil, I think. Back, back to the line, just a mom. <laughs> yes, yes. And for many, many years, yeah. I had such negative self talk because I felt lazy because I was just a mom. Um, until the, but my exhausted. Principal, when, <laughs> yeah, exhausted. Yeah. And, and the yeah. principal said to me, he says, you're not just a mom. He said, you're a caregiver, you you're a care. And, and as soon as uh, he said caregiver, I'm like, that's what I'm going to go by as a caregiver, because it is a job. And, 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 and even, I'm even, advocating. And, and also just like, there's no such thing as just a mom. Like just a mob yes. has raised all of society for all of history. <laughs> yeah. And we know, I mean, that's the right. stigma that comes with it. Right. And, and, you know, as, as women, uh, I'm very supportive of everybody, uh, women right. who stay at home, women who are caregivers who stay at home, women who choose to work. Like that's mm. why I believe and everybody's talking about everybody's lived experience because right. we all have lived experience and, and uh, I'm big on respecting that and validating that. Um, so that's my platform. That's, yeah, that's I, where I'm trying to move forward. And I just to reinforce what you're saying, I've been with our situation, I've been working both mm -hmm. girls. I went back to work when they were about eight weeks old. Mm. And I've been saying since I've been a mom, not just a mom, that yeah. I am an aspiring stay at home mom. Yes. Because that's, that's, that's real work. Well, <laughs> that's, and it that's is real and you know, history changing work. Yeah. And, and you know what I think yeah. the biggest thing I, I think with females too, is we find we can never be happy with ourselves. You know, I'm <laughs> right. like, Oh, I'm because, because I'm a caregiver stay at home mom, but I would love to be working. Right. right. So it's, because I want to feel like I'm contributing and, you are and, working, and, and, but and the social was, part of it, yeah. you know, but right. as we talk about, you know, when you're not right. having a check come in, right. It's very it's different. Like validated. From us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, right. you know, for me, I'm like, I I'm finally at the part where I'm like, I know I'm doing, I'm doing um, a lot of work and especially uh, into the community with my experience because of, you know, right. 16 years of advocating right. and I've, I've had, I've been through it all. Right. So. Um, and I'm sure I'm just you have a lot, there's a lot of value you can give, especially for folks who are um, like newly living with a diagnosis. Diagnosed? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is the biggest piece where, um, you know, uh, we're getting off topic a bit, but this is the bigger piece where we talk about the bullying and, you know, I'm trying to get at those newer parents uh, on my page because they need a healthy balance. They need right. to go in and not be bullied right away and told that they're terrible parents. And this is what's happening. <laughs> uh, you know, this is what's happening. It's it's really bad. And p parents, especially at the very beginning, need uh, that's what I wanted at the beginning. We never had social media. Right. And in a way, uh, it's a blessing because uh, the mental health of caregivers right now um, with the bullying is terrible. And that reflects on parents, like parents reflects on children because we are caregivers. So if you're contributing to the de decline in our mental health, you are contributing to the decline in our mental health, our kids, right? Because we're right. Exactly. co-regulators. Exactly. The best right? way to support children with autism is to support their parents. Exactly. Or if their parents aren't there, they're caregivers, right? Because I know there's a lot of- I call uh, you know, them parents. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a lot of grandparents who are, who are caregiving, a lot right, of grandparents. Right. And I, there's a wonderful so. family that I worked with that they, it was, it, they weren't blood relatives to most of their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I yeah. called them the parents because they yes. were <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, it's that fi family dynamic that it's not yeah. always just a traditional family. Right. So exactly, exactly. There are lots of ways. Um, yeah. So you've definitely shared a lot about, and I'm sure as the interviews unfold that you'll share even more about your relationship to yeah. autism. Would you say that you have a definition of autism that you're comfortable with? <sighs> I know when we talked earlier, I, uh, uh, autism to me is very complicated. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> it is it's very complicated and and every yeah. person is different and right. justin has been through so much he's different than he was when he was little right. uh you know as time as time came along you know i mean for aut for me autism is you know the, uh, issues with communication Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's nonverbal, verbal speaking, uh, you know, social interactions are difficult. Um, for Justin, sensory processing is a very big part of uh, the autism, which I would love to see in the DSM. It's not included in there, and it should be on its own it's um, because it, it's, it's very debilitating yeah. for yeah. a lot of. I mean, that's Justin's biggest thing is you know noise. Yeah. And, you know, being in large crowds and that's why we right. unschooled him because he just, you know, it lead to the um, lead to what our topic is, right, exactly. which is crisis, right, um, right. you know, and in sensory processing should be in the DSM. It should be. Right. It's interesting. I just I, I'm seeing you. I just came out of two back to back sessions right after um, the last two hours of my first ever DIR training. Mm -hmm. And um, he, um, Gil Tippy, who was leading the, the training, shared a uh, beautiful mother son. Um, but the mother, because I, I think that she had had a very narrow experience with OT, she didn't mm -hmm. want to deal with OT because they were so focused. And I remember as a speech therapist in the schools, feeling kind of like forced yeah. into this corner, just work yeah. on what's related to school. Yes. It yeah. reminds me of this line in Harry Potter that like, yeah. she says, put away your wands. Who, who was it? The the bad principal that came in for a while? Oh, uh, yes, and yes. They're like, but this is defensive against the dark hearts. She's like, no, yeah. all we, 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 we don't need that for the test. The whole mm -hmm. point is to learn, the whole point of being in school is to prepare you for the test. <laughs> yes, yes. And why would we need to work on anything else? And mm -hmm. I think that this mom's experience with OT had just been like, what has to be done in school, not life, but school. Yeah. Yeah. And so this child, he did fortunately make progress. They got to a, a yeah. good um, guide for them and who was able to guide the mom to guide their, the son mm -hmm. to guide himself. Um, but she was resistant to OT because it's a shame. And I think if it's not in the DSM, people don't think of it as part of or the mm -hmm. root of so much of what's going on. Well, I think the biggest issue is with my experience over the years has been um, it has to be one or one or the other, or it has to be uh, back when Justin was younger, it was IBI, which is intense behavioral right, intervention, right, right. which is more so than ABA. Right. Um, but that's all parents knew. So, uh, it's, you know, it's when what, you're looking at that, what a lot of people know is just the behavioral. Yes, not, yes. And yeah. that's um, my experience is especially, you know, yes, it's behavioral. Yes, there's OT. Yes, there's speech. So it's those three areas. Right. But I started learning that a lot of the behavior didn't need to be distinguished. And you need to find where it's, where is it coming from? Right. Why is it happening? So for Justin, a lot of it, he didn't need behavioral therapy. He needed an OT, occupational therapy, where we right. would talk about so understand his what's sensory going on processing. His, exactly, right. Yes, or, you know, is he having a hard time with transitioning, um, you know? it's not all like distinct distinguishing the behaviors which back then that's really what it was it was distinguishing behaviors it was you know hands down quiet you know all yeah. of that um and i didn't know any better but that's why i speak out now because um i have really delved into it has to be a mix of so many things right. and it changes over the years one one mm -hmm. thing you could be working on ot when he's like five and then you maybe don't need it for a couple of years and then you go back to you need speech you know so yeah. you have to be very flexible with what you're doing and and it's unique to your child or your student or your client and that's the important part learning different kind of techniques and applying them when you think they need them so what you're causing me to think of like now I'm sort of balancing between <laughs> interviewing everybody which is yep. actually my favorite part um yes. and um working with the coaching clients through the R RDI approach yep. um and I'm still seeing speech therapy clients mm -hmm. but what why I'm not I started as a speech therapist mm -hmm. and why I've sort of like come away from that is from the perspective of therapy and the way that mm -hmm. I was trained was a very behavioral approach. Like yes. Modifying and shaping behaviors, mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and speech behaviors, but behaviors. 
um, yes. is that I saw like from the clinical perspective, I just felt like, you know what the image is that comes to my mind? It's um, those, like a batting cage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like a batting cage that the, the like has just gone haywire. Yes. And it's just like balls yes. coming from all. So like dealing with symptoms, I feel like is as either as the individual, as the therapist, as the parent, is just being mm -hmm. in that batting cage with balls coming from all directions. And yes. that's what it felt like the first few years as a therapist. I was always thinking like, let's go deeper, mm -hmm. but let's mm -hmm. go deeper. And the more you go to the source, source of what's going on, the less you're in this crisis kind of like chasing, like what's gonna yeah. come at me next. Yes, yes. And the more also we can get to clearing what's getting in the way of the personal agency of the individual who's neurodiverse mm -hmm. and just like helping them to be in the world as themselves mm -hmm. and not as a set of symptoms. And I think that's the biggest challenge because the world is not built for those like Justin or, you know, uh, Melanie. Right. Uh, the world is not built for those who are autistic or have sensory processing. Right. And so, you know, I learned a long time ago, and this is just my opinion right through this uh, interview, mm -hmm. um, is what I've learned is that, you know, um, you kind of have to follow their lead. I, I, you right. know, I started doing that a long time with Justin, you know, especially when he was little, they would tell you, you know, I remember specifically, uh, specifically he would stack blocks and right. some would be upside down some would be the right way mm -hmm. and you know they were telling you go in there and change those blocks you know, mix them up on purpose mm -hmm. you know and I'm, i think now i would never do that i would never do that now but you were taught you know just to get in there and kind of engage with them and mix and i'm like that how frustrating is that mm -hmm. and yes he got frustrated you know instead i would have just kept on right now if i was doing it just kept on putting those blocks on just you know turn taking natural interest led teaching for me is what I'm doing now. And that's where we are in validation. Right. That's where we're seeing huge gains. And it's, we'll never get away from behavior. I don't believe we're ever going to get away from meltdowns and behaviors uh, for kids, especially when you're in um, schools or any large place, because it's, it's not overwhelming. built for them. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it's not built for them. And you know, you're making them transition fast, you're making them go from class to mm -hmm. class, like where Justin mm -hmm. was in high school, he's not ready to transition fast, we need mm -hmm. to bend the rules. We need to say to, to the EAs, uh, educational assistants, it's Thank you. okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. educational assistant. It is Canada. a little bit different say, name, so I didn't want. I wasn't sure what it yes, was. Like, yes, in so, Canada, it's uh, EA. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Educational assistants. We need to say, and to teachers, um, you know, let's be more flexible here. Uh, yeah. Depending on your child, like with Justin, as a parent, I I would be okay with. Um, you know, if he needs to be pulled out of the class for uh, like a, a resource room um, because he can't focus in the classroom. Some people don't want that, They're, but your kid is different. If your kid is more social and wants to be right in there, that's good. But my son needed to be pulled a lot. And right, right. I was okay with that because it was the only way he was going to function. Uh, I getting think it was breaks. hard though for the, from the perspective, because I, you know, I was working in schools. I don't know if you know. I'll tell you, I was, okay. I was working in schools for like the first, I've lost track, several years um, okay. of, especially as, as a speech therapist. There's no, yeah. there's no RGI position in the public schools that I, systems that I worked in, but um, mm -hmm. I worked in schools and early intervention, like basically birth to 21 over those years. Yeah. And I think what you're saying and why it makes so much sense that your family in the end chose unschooling mm -hmm. is yes. that you have X number of kids, but X mm -hmm. smaller number of adults, mm -hmm. but the, the individual needs of those kids don't change just because there are fewer adults to accommodate them. And that's where yes. you get into this catch me too. Like the schools to a degree are going to be overwhelming because you have a group of especially with neurodiverse kids who aren't mm -hmm. built the way that schools are built. That's right. That are going to need the individual attention from a fewer number of adults than there are children, mm -hmm. which it's, it's always, it's this tension. Okay. So this actually is a good transition to our first topic, which was mm -hmm. your personal story of getting out of crisis. 
Okay. Yeah. So um, just pre-COVID, um, yeah. we were going through a crisis in school, which um, we were dealing with um, aggression, uh, sphere aggression, and blind rage. So it was happening at school, meltdowns. So, so this is school. what Justin was experiencing. Yes, this is what Justin was experiencing. So this yeah. was going, um, you know, he went into high school. Uh, so he was in the Catholic board and the Catholic board, it's all about inclusion. So they go to a typical class like everybody else. So does that mean um, it was a private school? No, it's not. Uh, well, Catholic is Catholic board is like, yeah, they're, they're privately not private. They get funding uh, as opposed to there's a public school, but it's not private. It's just based on like the religion. In between. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So they get their own funding. Um, you know, I was just raised Catholic. I'm like, just went to school and never thought yeah. anything of that, you know? Yeah. Um, but and you're in Ontario? So, yes, we're in Ontario, Ontario, Canada, okay. uh, close to Toronto, close to okay. Toronto. And um, so, uh, you know, the transition from elementary into high school is very different. Uh, you know, more students, more uh, changing from class to class. Right, uh, right, more, more transitions. More, uh, yeah, more educational assistance, faster, um, you know, faster transitions. And Justin has a very big lag in, in processing. Right. Processing. And, you know, yeah. And, and if you don't, I mean, in school, it's fast, right? It's fast right. paced. It, it, they don't have time to and loud. wait for him to, yeah. And loud yeah. Oh, and yeah. loud, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Justin is a very big, um, he is a very big people pleaser. And a lot of that came from you know, IBI, which was right. again, compliance based, compliance based um, yeah. uh, you know, and, you know, everybody can do what they want to or with their children and believe in that. But from my experience, um, compliance based teaching will backfire. Right. I'm That's saying right I've now seen. as a That's 17 year old, he cannot say no. He doesn't know how to say no. And it's I'm just learning as now. As it is yeah. because, yeah. you know, a lot of the autistic adults will say you're setting your child up for for abuse and I'm thinking no I couldn't see it but now I'm like yeah he doesn't know how to say no even though I know he wants to say I no I think what makes sense to people about it is you just describe like we're talking about how school is yes how a school compliance almost, almost has to be because mm -hmm. you can't have everybody doing their own thing that's right it just doesn't work you need everybody to flow from one class to the next from one lesson that's to right. the next from one That's room right. to the next but and it has but, to be compliant with, to fit into school yes. but in actual life but also yeah. there's the sense of self go i think you're gonna say it i'll let you say it <laughs> well my issue yeah. is we, we talk about compliance space but we're right. also talking about accommodation Okay. So for Justin right. to be able to transition fast, which he can't do because his processing time is right. slower, his exactly. executive functioning is right. slower, he's right. dealing with noise, he's bombarded with everything. Which probably I would slows love to down see. everything, I'm guessing. Yes, I would, yeah. what I want to see is accommodate, real accommodation where the EA is not rushing that child right. to go to the other class. And, you know, if they're showing up a little bit late to class, but they're going in fine and not in a meltdown state, mm. you're going to have more success but you're pushing them and you're forcing them to do the things all day long and they have That's no exactly. choice. And, and you're not going to get away from meltdowns. You will not, if you're doing that all day to any child that has a, uh, you know, uh, challenges like, like Justin does. Uh, and that's why you're going to always, I don't think you'll ever get rid of meltdowns in schools uh, because it's not set up for kids. You know, it's just go, 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 go all day. And, and their brains aren't that like the typical brain. Well, I mean, I think that what we're talking about is like, I'm trying to think how to articulate this. It's looking at it from a macro perspective, like from a bird's mm -hmm. eye view. Yeah. What folks are wanting is just flow, like just yeah. make it work. Yeah. And what seems to make sense is just be compliant to the system. Yeah. And I think, especially if you're looking at it from the outside of everything, mm -hmm. that what you're looking at is behaviors. It's like, okay, if we can make the, yeah. the behaviors compliant to the flow of the system, then that's called working. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're describing is like the, the piece that's ignored and will not continue to be ignored is that there's an individual inside of all of that. 
Yes. And that's no. why I always talk about empathy because right. we need to start looking at, I always ask myself, how would I feel if this were me? Right. How would I feel now? If I knew that, and I know what Justin's challenges are. So if you know what the child or adult or teen's challenges are, you apply that in your brain to thinking, okay, if they're having a really hard time with noise um, and it's really loud in here, well, maybe he needs a break because you're forcing that person into um, into a mold where they're not they're not going to fit into it because their their challenges are will always be there. So you know, shaping them into this little mold long term is is ruining their mental health i will say that because ultimately I've been enough, they don't fit ultimately they don't they don't fit, fit. Yeah. And, and why do we have to, like right. this is society society is telling them they have to fit right and if you're the other one on the other end like when justin was going through his crisis his mental health my mental health we were fast declining because he wasn't able to do what they wanted him to do and it really bothers me when um, educators and adults of, and parents, uh, anybody in the system puts the burden on those like my son or any student or client that can't um, can't comply because their their genetic makeup is not that way. So now you're you're contributing to how many times would they blame Justin for his behavior? You know, and it's as a parent, it broke my heart because I'm like, he's not meaning to do this. He has no choice because that's his body telling him. That's the way his body reacts. This is, I you think, know? one of the biggest ironies that I see in mm -hmm. the way that the world generally deals with autism yep. is that everybody's sort of like standing in this, in a circle, pointing to the center of the circle, the person with autism yes. saying, you have a problem with empathy, with theory of mind, yes. with understanding our perspective. But how often mm -hmm. is anybody in the system taking the time to get inside the head of the person on the spectrum? And yeah, like I, it, yeah. for me, it's yeah. easy because I have really high emotional intelligence. That's what right. people have been telling me. So right, I'm, right, I guess right. I'm claiming it no, now. I, yeah. <laughs> but for me, it's like, okay, if I was in the center of that circle exactly, exactly. and everybody was around me pointing there saying, it's your fault. This is happening. This right, is it. Right. Well, imagine my decline in my mental health and my negative right. self-talk and my behaviors are going to increase because inside, although the communication is not there, the right. thoughts are inside the head. And, or the, and at least going, the emotions, even if they're not put yeah. into words or the experiences. There. Yes. Yeah. And to say there's no empathy, uh, Justin has, he, both of my kids are very high in empathy. Right. Um, and you would never know that when Justin was going through his crisis. Um, but now it's, you know, a lot of his meltdowns would come from being around crying babies when he was little. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's the noise, it's the noise. And then one time we were at an indoor playground and there was a little boy crying and Justin looked like he was going to grab him around the throat. So I was holding Justin back oh and I let him go. And you know what he did? He went to go grab a Kleenex oh. and gave it to the boy. And that's one story I talk about often because I'm like, that is the top of the line empathy, right? The top of the line, right. all he wanted to do. And here I'm thinking, oh, he's going to have a major meltdown because it's so loud. Right. He wanted to go and give the boy a Kleenex. And the thinking, mother was even surprised. Yeah, I'm thinking. I was surprised. Things. I'm thinking two things. Like a lot of times when like we're able to slow down and listen to the way the folks on the spectrum are communicating with us. Yeah. In the best mm -hmm. way that they can. A lot of times what they're expressing is actually a higher level of empathy. And that I also agree. oftentimes is leading to the overwhelm. Yes. Which looks like shut down, which looks like the opposite. That's one yes. thing that I'm thinking. The other thing that I'm thinking is, again, like coming from the communication, like mm -hmm. I think I'm always going to have like sort of like, I, I do recognize that I, in a lot of ways, would be better if I was part OT as well. And I'm all- Yes, I'm, yeah, well, you have that kind of training in your brain. I'm, fre I'm frequently trying to like become more of an OT, but I think I'm always going to yeah. be thinking more communication because I'm a speech therapist. Of course. And I remember at a certain point, like at IEP meetings, like people saying like, this kid is this, this kid is like mm -hmm. saying like, look, I would say it as myself, not like as if you, yeah. but like, if, like yeah. I know that if I was in an engine, like if somebody suddenly stuck me in an engineering program in Japanese yeah. and 
put a lot of pressure that my whole self-worth and my future was based on my success without yeah. teaching me really Japanese or engineering. Yeah. I think I would kind of be behaving like your son. Yes. Yes. You know, like, and that's I think I might be behave a little bit like your daughter because yeah. of like the pressure and the inability to like meet the demands. And that's, and that's what I used to always say. Like if I had to deal with noise and I had to deal with it and I look, name off all the things Justin struggled with, I said, I would be on the ground. I would be kicking. Right. I would be screaming. That's our natural reaction. It's fight or flight. And they're scared. It's, it's, right. you know, the aggression right. exactly. can be fear. Exactly. It's, it's coming Justin's fear. aggression was fear. I thought it was anger, right. but right. it's fear uh, because we started getting restrained. That's um, scary. <laughs> And That's I'll tell you right scary. now what re what right. restraining when we talk about restraining when we talk about safety, as in we don't let somebody bang their head on the ground. That's Not just you know Not you don't let that happen, yeah. right? That's where you would restrain. Uh, for Justin and for so many others, restraining can also add fuel to the fire. Right. Many do not like to be touched. Right. So if you're holding somebody back and they're terrified, well, they're going to fight even more. And which is what Justin was doing. He was becoming more aggressive. Right. So instead of what many parents would say, well, leave your kid in school. It's up to them. And all, just all through Justin growing up and I was blessed that I was at home. I took him out. I said, this is about Justin's dignity. It's not about anybody else, but Justin. It's his dignity. And if he's on the ground and students are looking like they're afraid of him, then I'm going to pull him out until he's ready to go back. And I did that. Um, and unschooling was the, the reaction to never taking him back because COVID hit and we found he did better at home. So it's like, it's, it's, so that was it, the transition no, to it, go to unschool. So, so Cindy, thank you so much. Like it's, thank you. I, I am learning. I've known you for a few weeks, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but I feel like I'm learning so much from you because I, I have a parent experience, but like my child yes. also, it's like, she has a hearing impairment that we didn't notice until she was five. It's not like, yeah. it's not the same yeah, thing as not, being yes, yeah. Justin's parent or like yeah. somebody with a more, you know, or a different experience. So I'm learning yeah. so much. And I know that you provide such, such great stuff for the parents that are on your page and the adults with autism. Do you have a message that you'd like to share? Like at the end of this interview, I have a feeling that yeah, yeah. we'll do another one. But, uh, yes, yes. And you yeah. know what? I'm all up for that. I, you know, it's my passion. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's my life, right? It's, uh, it's something that I've um, just grown with and I've accepted and acceptance was the best thing for me to do for my family right. and for myself. Right. Um, much happier at being unschooled. Uh, Justin and I are doing fantastic as pair right. uh, caregiver and child uh, teen. Uh, he's going to be 18 this year. So we're going to be going into adult services and I'm right. terrified. Yeah. Um, but like everything, I live my life and I go in little steps. When I was younger, right. when, when Justin was younger, I just was so concentrated on the future. Right. Um, but now we're here planning for adult services and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go day by day and do what I could. Uh, but my message is it will always remain the same. And uh, that's for acceptance, right. um, for you know, autism, neurodiversity, ADHD, mental health, um, crisis. You know, uh, let's find some more resources for crisis. Right. Um, for families and individuals and uh you know everybody has a lived experience and it's respecting that it's validating each other and using your empathy that's my message yeah, yeah. and i just and i, I hope more people just, do that yeah and just if i could tack on and just see if you will allow me to tack this onto your message yeah that like just finding your people and finding your team yes 100%. It's made a huge difference yeah. for me. Uh, social media, I continue to tell, uh, especially caregivers, if you're in a group and you go in and you're leaving more depressed, then get out of there. Yeah. Uh, because misery loves yourself. company. You misery loves company. Yourself, right? And in, in the days when I was depressed and angry, I was around people like that because they were like, yeah, I'm like, you're validating each other. Right. But there comes a time when if you right. want to grow, if you want to grow and get into a balanced, healthy state, you need to move on and you need to start looking at the strengths. Uh, and I that's, that. you know, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I so love that. thank you thank for, you so for interviewing much. me and of yeah. course. And then of course, if people want to find you, if you could please send me your, yep. um, and we'll put it in the comment section down below. 
Yep, I can do that. I'll send you the links and uh, we'll do that. So thanks for interviewing me and, uh, you know, I hope others learn uh, empathy is the answer for everything. Amen. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. We'll talk later.